for arrest, then what happens after that arrest in terms of charging. Um, and then there are also racial disparities in how records are used against folks. So the negative impact of um, the, the negative impact on getting a job interview is greater for black applicants than it is white applicants. In fact, it's about twice as severe. So if you have a record and you're black, you're much less likely to be able to get a record than a, a white person that has a record. The impact that impacts all of, you know, the effect of this for all of us is that people that are, have been involved in the criminal legal system are either unemployed or underemployed, and this results in about $372 billion in lost wages annually. So a great impact on the whole country. So how do we address this issue? One of the ways that we address it is by creating laws that allow people to clear or seal a record of an arrest or a conviction after a certain period of time. A lot of folks know this as expungement. That's the word that a lot of states use, but we don't use that in Georgia. Um, it looks different in every state, but basically it's a process where we're limiting access to somebody's, uh, the record of somebody's interaction with the criminal le legal system. In Georgia, like I said, we don't have expungement. We have, um, most records are cleared through a process called restriction and sealing. It's a two-step process. The restriction part of that, the first step that has, has to happen is access through the state database is limited. The second and most important part of that record clearing process is the access to the clerk's file it is limited through a sealing process. And this is the most important part because most folks, when they go out to look for a job, when they, let's say I go to apply for a job with Target, they're gonna pull a private background check report on me. Um, and those private background check companies get their records through clerk's offices of the, the court where their case was resolved. So the big picture of where we are in Georgia, most records, um, the records of arrests that didn't lead to a conviction generally can be restricted and sealed from your record. That comes as a surprise to a lot of people who, you know, don't think that an arrest might continue to haunt you or continue to be a barrier. Um, but there is a process where we have to clear those up for folks. On the conviction side, a person can potentially seal up to two misdemeanor convictions in their lifetime. Um, there are quite a few exceptions, misdemeanor convictions that are not included in that and, and can't be sealed. So an, a notable exception that we get a lot of requests for is DUI. Georgia law just doesn't allow DUI to come off of somebody's record no matter how much time has passed. On the felony conviction side, folks that received a pardon from the State Board of Pardons and Paroles can potentially seal or expunge the record of their felony conviction, as long as it was not a serious violent felony or a serious sexual offense. This is a small number of people. Getting a pardon is very difficult in Georgia. Only about 450 people a year get it. It's a very intensive process. So this process, all sealing, um, whether it's a non-conviction or conviction, and all restriction and sealing of convictions in Georgia is through a petition-based process. So what that means is that I've got to file something with the court to clear my record. I could potentially have a hearing, and I have to go in front of a judge, and I have to make the argument that the public's interest in having access to this record is less than the potential harm to me because I can't find a place to live because I can't get a job. So it can be a quite an intensive process for folks. So big picture, most non-convictions, up to two misdemeanor convictions, pardoned felonies, and then one last area that I wanted to mention, um, which is fairly new in Georgia, is there's a path for survivors of human trafficking to be able to, to clear their record. So what GJP does to, um, to try to reach folks who have a record, like I said, there's 4.5 million Georgians. That's a lot. We're a small office. Um, up to 1.5 million people in Georgia who have only one or two misdemeanor conviction could potentially clear their record completely so they didn't have any convictions. That's a lot of folks. What we do is we represent people in-house through our, our attorneys. We have a volunteer clinic where we've trained hundreds of volunteers from all, all paths. You don't have to know anything about criminal law. It could be a corporate attorney, it could be a, a patent attorney, and we will walk you through the process. Um, we, in 2016, we started 
partnering with other organizations and local jurisdictions to work on expungement sum summits, these events that Judge Ponder is going to talk about a lot more. And there's been about 75 of those events all around the state um, since since 2016, with there would have been more, but of course we had a couple of years where we ha we had to go virtual and try to do it that way. And then in 2021, one thing that we're really proud of at Georgia Justice Project is in partnership with stakeholders in Cobb County, including one that we will hear from later, District Attorney uh, Brody, we launched the first Second Chance Desk in Georgia. So we are up there every week helping to clear records in Cobb County and getting ready to launch a couple more of those community-based efforts. And then the last thing that I wanna mention that we do is we launched a pardon clinic in 2022 because the only way for people to clear a, a felony is through a pardon. We wanna increase access to pardons. So we have been working with law students and volunteer attorneys to help increase access to that. So that's the, the big picture and what Georgia Justice Project is doing. Thank you so much for that, Brenda. We're gonna to go to you next, uh, Judge Ponder. The Judicial Council Standing Committee on Access to Justice has gotten three years of grants to hold records restriction clinics. Share with our viewers some vital uh, components needed to host a records restriction clinic. Okay, one thing I've, I've learned, and again, when we started these clinics, we were focusing on the rural areas in Georgia, not the, the inner cities. Um, so before we even got started, we reached out to some community partners and collaborators, which of course is, you know, the leaders in this area, Georgia Justice Project and Georgia Legal Services uh, Program, they also agreed to be our partners at the table before we even launched this uh, clinic. We we also learned gathering volunteer attorneys around the state is very vital as it relates to this clinic and the program and the success of it. Community service organizations, we reached out to several community service organizations because not everyone who attends the clinic can benefit from the services. So we wanted to have a holistic approach to the clinics uh, that we were, you know, out is to bring some other services since one um one very important thing i learned probably in the most rural area was pr how do we get the word out right in atlanta we take it for granted that we can post on social media or contact the local um maybe a news channel or something to that effect. But in the rural areas, they are a lot of hands-on. We had to deliver flyers. Um, it's, cr it's crucial to reach out to like certain ministries and, so and certain social service organizations so they can help spread the word. A lot of uh, the rural areas, they do rely on word of mouth and we, we, we learned that. It's also very important to include your judges. Uh, before we even go into a community, we make sure we reach out to the chief judge, make sure the judges are on board. And I found, and I can talk a little bit about that later, but definitely before we ever launched the clinic, we always partnered and got the, um, to, to include the judges in the area, as well as the prosecutors, the sheriff's office, because the sheriff's offices were very instrumental in helping us to their um, their records, their criminal histories. And a lot of times we would get them to pull the criminal histories for free, which is very helpful for a lot of these um, individuals, as well as the clerk's office. You did hear Brenda mention that. Uh, we had a very successful clinic in Tifton, in, in Valosta, where in the clerk's office showed up and they came and personally uh, assisted during the clinic itself. So having all of those uh, individuals, all of those uh, collaborators at the table, all, you know, looking towards the same goal, striving towards the same goal is very instrumental in having a very successful record restrictions clinic. Thank you so much for that, Judge. Sarah, you are next. So Sarah, you work for Georgia Legal Services Program, which provides a wide variety of legal services for the poor. Uh, we were just informed that you guys hosted a records restriction clinic in Wake Cross, Georgia. Would you mind sharing just a little bit about uh, what you saw in uh, Wake Cross and how that has uh, benefited the community? Sure. Um, Wake Cross in Ware County is um, 
it's kind of in between two of our regional offices. So they're not, they're not very close to either of our regional offices. It's an area that um, didn't get, hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but we went in there. We partnered with Sean Taylor of Love Feeds and, um, and she hosted us at the Southern Georgia Regional Commission building. And we, uh, we had a, we had a, a nice turnout. We had 20 people who re initially registered. We had 18 who actually qualified for services. Ware County Sheriff ran all of our GCICs for us at no cost, which was one absolutely wonderful. And um, we had 14 people who attended and we provided advice and counsel on, on pardons, on um, eligible misdemeanor convictions, first offender issues, retroactive first offender, and we did help clients fill out more than 40 applications to restrict arrest records, which were just turned over to the DA's office last week. I drove back over to Waycross last week and turned those in. And um, it was it was great. We had a, a great, um, great reception by the local community. They were so happy to have us out there. And we also were able to get out a lot of information about our program um, because we do this work and this is the only criminal work that we are allowed to do. I shouldn't say criminal work. The only work we are allowed to do in criminal court under our federal grant, but we are allowed to do it because it opens up access to, um, to other issues that our clients have, which is trouble getting subsidized housing, trouble getting into public benefits and, and trouble finding employment. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. Brenda, back to you. Tell us a little bit about what can be done on the policy front to expand record clearing. How was this recent legislative session for records restriction work? And do you see any future improvement for expansion? Sure, so Georgia Justice Project has been working since about 2010 to expand access to record clearing in Georgia. Um, and over the years, we've had a number of changes and expansions to the law, um, sort of slowly um, expanding it. The biggest win that we had was in 2020 um, with the passage of Senate Bill 288, which went into effect January 2021. Up until January of 2021, primarily what we could seal from somebody's record was a non-conviction. There was a very narrow path for convictions, which was folks that were under the age of 21 when they were convicted of certain misdemeanors. So not something that's going to be available to most folks. Um, no path for felonies, no path if you were over 21. So we uh, we were thrilled to be able to pass that major expansion in Georgia. We partnered with a number of employers and chambers of commerce to give the business perspective. You know, a lot of employers that maybe um, were hesitant about second chance hiring, hiring folks with a record, I really started to reevaluate that in recent e years as they learn more about racial disparities in the system and also as they experience labor shortages. So we were able to partner with them and we were also able to include some liability protections for employers, which can be a real concern. So, like I said, thrilled about that, but we still have a long ways to go in Georgia. So I mentioned that our system for sealing, sealing records, records is all petition based. based. So you've, you've got, got to go to court, court. Um, something that's not accessible to a lot of folks. These, these record, these summits that we, we have in partnership with local stakeholders are great, the desks are great. Um, but when, when you've, you've got four and a half million, million people with a record, record there's a lot of work to do and it's you can sort of never get there. You know, there, there's always more to do. So, so studies, studies from, from other states, states show that states that have systems like we do, where you have to file something with the court, Usually, Usually only about 6% 6 of folks that are eligible are able to access that remedy. So far in Georgia, which I know we're, you know, we're just starting, but only about 0.06% of folks who have a misdemeanor conviction have been able to get that. So under 1,000 folks um, have been able to get convictions off of their records. So lots of work left to be done. So this session, we had a sort of a minor, minor bill, bill, which we considered a cleanup bill. bill. It had a couple of expansions. We're trying to get rid of that two misdemeanor limit. You know, a lot of folks go through a difficult period in their life where they may have a number of arrests, but that has nothing to do with who they are now and what they've gone through. You know, maybe they've been through treatment. Um, they should be able to move on from that record. And then it had some other cleanups that we were and fixes that we were hoping to, to um, get into place. Unfortunately, the legislative session was... Um, 
we, we sort of ran out of time, time you know, 40, 40 days of our session, session does, and there, there were a lot of you know, new folks in the legislature and a lot of controversial issues on the agenda, so we sort of ran out of time. We've got a two-year session. Uh, we had a lot of support, again, continuing to work with our partners to to, to push, push that forward, forward and we will be back, back at it next year. But I also want to mention that long term, the only really good solution for Georgia and most other states is something called clean slate reform. So you may have heard this, a lot of states are moving towards this system where records after a certain amount of time are automatically expunged. So the person doesn't have to do anything. It's just like, okay, your misdemeanor conviction was five years ago, was seven years ago. We're going to go ahead and expunge and seal it so that it doesn't, so that it doesn't continue to impose a barrier for you. This is challenging in Georgia because unlike other states that have passed these clean slate laws, we don't have what's called a unified court system. So we've got 159 counties that are all operating on their own record keeping system, sometimes multiple courts in those counties. So lots of work to be done there to sort of bring our system to where we want it to be. Um, but ultimately, we, we hope to find ways to get there. Um, and also, we will just continue to work with employers to educate them about both the protections in the law for them and the benefits of hiring people with a record. But lots, lots more work to do on the policy front. Thank you for that, Brenda. Tabitha? Tell us why you think it is so important to have courts and community partners involved in records restriction work. She might have frozen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wait, okay, I'm, I'm a, sorry, I'm at St. Simon's Island at this conference. <laughs> so my internet might have been shaky. What was your question? I'm sorry. It's fine. Uh, just tell us uh, why you think it is important to have the courts and community partners involved in records restriction work. Okay, with regards to the court, um, what we did notice was, I believe Columbus and Brenda, you you were with us on this. Columbus, Georgia area, the judges were on board from the beginning. And what I saw was when the chief judge is actually pushing this event or this, this um, this project or initiative, you you tend to see a lot of other community partners or collaborators get on board without um, hesitation. Usually the DA's office or prosecutor's office, the, the volunteer attorneys, as well as other judges and other classes of courts. So they having the chief judge to be the leader, um, to be that voice saying, hey, we are bringing this to the community uh, for the our residents here has, was the it, it changed the whole picture um, and actually having it streamlined, identifying like one particular ADA or uh, a prosecutor to handle it. So it was kind of like a pipeline and it was really helpful. And that was our most successful one. We actually had to go back and do this part two because we had a great turnout and a lot of support from the community. And as, as far as the community service organizations, having those organizations in place after records have been cleared, you know, or they sometimes they think they can't uh, vote because they've had a criminal uh, record in the past. And just getting that knowledge out to these individuals, having voters registration there, having um, housing there, uh, we, we had so many different service, uh, social service organizations there, but people were able to benefit from those organizations. A part of uh, the Board of Pardon and Paroles, they came out. So um, it's very, very helpful because not everyone, you know, will be able to benefit from the, the record restriction clinic itself. So that was very um, helpful. And I would like to thank um, Georgia Justice Project as well as uh, Georgia Legal Services Program, they've been instrumental in helping us train other um, agencies, such as you'll hear from ADA Hargrove in a minute. Uh, we called Brenda's office uh, when they called and said, look, we want to create a portal, an online system, so folks can always get their records cleared or at least start the process. We want to have something here all the time, not just wait on us to do a clinic. And so that's very helpful, as well as... Um, uh, Georgia Legal Services. Thank you all for, for help, helping prepare videos for self-help folks, and they are they are pinned to our website so that folks can at least get some information, start the process, um, and it's a step-by-step -step guide, so it's very helpful. So thank you both. Thank you, Tabitha. 
Sarah, tell us what Georgia Legal Services Program plans for the future in regards to records restriction work. Well, moving forward, we are um, working on identifying areas of the state that have few to, uh, to no attorneys where they really need services to come in. We're also working on developing, um, bringing in attorneys from outside areas by Zoom to counsel with the clients so that we can um, increase our, our number of volunteer attorneys, make it easy for them. The attorneys want to do it. The traveling to the rural areas can be a, a tough, tough ask at times. So we're, we're working on that Zoom program. Um, the first few, the first few attorneys who've tried it, we, we've we've been learning a lot, um, and the first few attorneys who've tried, tried it are are great partners with us who volunteered with us for a long time, and are really able to help us kind of fine tune that moving forward. Um, we're also looking at um, opening up record restriction to um, victims of human trafficking and helping them clear their records, and. Uh, one day down the road, and Brenda, I'll have to pick your brain, is to work on a pardon clinic because we do have a lot of people who come into clinics and contact us asking for assistance with pardon applications. Thank you so much. I have one final question, and this is for all of our lovely uh, panelists. We'll go ahead, we'll just start with Brenda, Judge, and then we'll end with you, Sarah. So, my question is tell us your best story of the impact of records restriction work. Well, well, I don't know, this is my best story, story. but one that comes to mind is um, somebody, somebody that we were able to help through the Cobb County Second, Second Chance Desk. desk. Um, and he, he was a young father of two adorable, adorable children, which is probably why his story always sticks with me, that were with him when he came to, to get help with his record. He had a couple of misdemeanor convictions that he got when he was 17 and 18 years old, including one where he was convicted. He recording in progress. He was just in the process a couple months away from completing his certification to be an airplane mechanic, something that we desperately need. Um, and he had been denied employment with one of the major airlines and was hoping to clear his record. We were able to completely clear his record and he was able to get a job using the skills that he had obtained through that course. Um, so we stay in touch with him and he is doing great. So. It's, it's it, you, you get to meet a, real, a, lot a lot of really wonderful people when you do this work who have um, stories of, of you know, the challenges, challenges that they face and, and how, how they overcome their record and you know, they stick with you. Thank you, Brenda. Judge? All right. So many stories. I'm like Brenda. Um, I do have a couple of stories. One about a nurse who was able to take her board's exam. One with regards, I think, a fireman in Albany during the last clinic. He was he got his re record cleared. He was able to go on and become a fireman. But my most touching story is a gentleman that was like maybe 70 plus years old in Dory County. And this is one of the uh, the other ones that he came and got some education and he had not voted in over 40 years and he thought he could not vote and he was like I can vote and so he we actually got him registered there on site and I believe he had like maybe one felony or something to that I cannot remember exactly if he had to go through the pardon process but at any rate when he got registered to vote he was so excited that he could vote in an election and that was like, my, I think that's my favorite story. Thank you, Judge. Sarah? Well, uh, like Brenda and Judge Ponder, there's a, there's a lot and there's a lot of stories. And, and I agree with Brenda, there's some great people that you meet doing this kind of work. I think the one um, most recently that really strikes me is we had a client from a clinic actually last year and he, he only had a few charges. They were all well over 20 years old but they were holding him back. And when we reviewed his record at the clinic, we realized we couldn't help him with anything at the clinic because um, he had major errors on his record. Um, one of which was a charge, a serious charge in there that was not his, it was someone from a completely different name. And so one of our volunteers at the clinic agreed to take the case uh, for long-term representation. 
got the wrongful charge, a chart, like I said, he didn't, we didn't even know who the guy was, wasn't a friend, wasn't someone who used his name. He got that taken off of the record, got that record corrected, and then went and uh, filed a motion for retroactive first offender on his other cycle. And, um, and in the course of the last six, eight months, all the convictions are now restricted on his record. And the one little non-conviction he has, has has also been restricted. Thank you all so much for joining us. I believe it was a lovely discussion. I've learned a lot. I'm pretty sure our viewers learned a lot. We want to thank Georgia Justice Project, you, Brenda, Georgia Legal Services, you, Sarah, and you, of course, Judge Ponder, for this wonderful discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, Deontay, and thank you all panelists. We've been um, hearing a little bit about what's happening at the statewide level. We're going to switch gears now, and we're going to hear a little bit more about what's happening at the at the local level. And I wanted to kick off with um, DA Brody. DA Brody, can you turn your camera on and join us? <laughs> hey. Hey, how are you? I'm great. So we have uh, bios of all of our panelists, um, both statewide and local, in the link that um, Darcy just posted. But I just wanna talk a little bit about what's happening in Cobb County and Henry County to give you guys some ideas of what's happening at a local level. DA Brody, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to your current position? Um, where do I start? Let me see. Uh, I guess I'll start with my military service because that has a lot to do with the way I feel about the things that we're talking about today. Um, I spent 26 years in the Army. Um, I was a combat infantryman. Um, one of the things that I did do while I was there was, you know, sort of rehabilitate a lot of young men who um, probably most people wanted to throw away because they had done something wrong. Um, one of the things that made me want to become a lawyer was to, to help the underdog. And I thought as a prosecutor, I could really do that more effectively than as a defense attorney. Um, and started off in the Solicitor General's office, um, prosecuting misdemeanors. Um, I did some time in veterans court as the coordinator for our veterans court here in Cobb County, um, where I helped veterans who had run-ins with the law to get their lives back on track. Um, and then I ran for district attorney, um, was elected in, in November of 2020 and started in January 2021. Uh, one of the first things I did was for our accountability courts was to make sure that anybody that completed those uh, was able to get their charges dismissed to help them keep their records clean. Um, Brenda and the Georgia Justice Project came to us about um, a record restriction um, desk um, led by our, um, what was my executive ADA at the time, uh, Latonia Hines. I um, mean, I was all for the idea because I truly believe that um, the criminal justice system is designed to rehabilitate, not just to punish. And one of the things that we do a bad job of it, when we keep people with records, uh, we keep them from being able to move forward in life. And, and I can't tell you how many people have come to me and told me that a marijuana charge or something similar has kept them from getting a job, has kept them from getting a promotion, has kept them from getting decent housing. And as a result, they've been held back. And then through the record restriction desk and the work that Georgia Justice Project has done, uh, we've helped so many people to be able to to move forward in their lives. So it's just such such an important thing that we do. And so the record restriction desk, it's publicly called the second chance desk, right? Correct. Um, is there anything, I, I think you're, are you the only one who has a second chance desk? And I wanted to ask you, is there anything behind that name, second chance desk? Um, you know, I think the reason we, we, we started with second chance desk is put, because basically we were taking people or individuals that had been basically thrown away and now clearing their record, uh, having their record restricted and sealed is, is one of the things that we make sure we do also. Uh, we were giving them that second chance to succeed in life. And I think that's why we stuck with second chance. I believe we, I know we were the first, but I know uh, Brenda and them were working on a second one. I'm not sure if they've gotten that one started yet. Okay, okay, good to know. And you talked a little bit about how it, gets how it got started, but just for our viewers, do you, is there anything more to say about how it got started in bureaucracy? Did you have to get people on board? Was it something that a DA can make a decision by themselves? It's not something the DA can make a decision by himself. It takes a lot of cooperation uh, from the um, 
the circuit defender from the solicitor general's office from our our, our state and, and superior court judges uh, we all had to work together to put the project together and also our county by giving us the space to do this um, and at times it seemed very you know it took us a long time to get it going um, to the point that you know i very seldom yell at folks <laughs> Uh, but in this case, I had to do that in order to get them to, to, to get off the pot because what I was telling you, you know, we keep delaying this and there are people that really need help. And we finally got it started, even, even though there were still a lot of questions, we got it started and the work of, of, of Brenda and her group has, has made it successful. Well, I really like the name of Second Chance Desk. I think it's a, it really sends out a good PR message about what it is. And so how do you think it's working now? How do you think on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you think that it's working? I, I think it's working, working fabulous. Um, they only, they're only there one, one, uh, one day a week and that's on Fridays. Um, and I believe they've, they've helped over 600 people in, in, the, in the small amount of time that they've been up and running. And like Brenda said, you, you hear the stories from the, those that it's helped and you can't help but wish to expand it. Um, and one of the things that I've done as district attorney uh, is whenever we participate in any events here in Cobb County, where my office sets up a, a table or anything, I always invite the Georgia Justice Project uh, so that way they can continue to, to deliver their message of what they can do and how they can help people to get them back on the road to success. And just like in the last panel, I just wanted to ask you if you had any story, what's your best story, any story that really has stuck with you about the impact of the second chance death? I, I you know, I think the biggest story is, is you know, the, the attorneys that help out these individuals. You know, sometimes we're so focused on the individuals, but the attorneys that help them to get their records cleared, to get their, their stuff sealed, they, they, they have just as much joy as the, as the defendant or the offender when they get their stuff cleared because we really want people to be successful. Um, we see that most of the folks that we are afraid of in, in our community, the murderers and the rapists, somewhere along the line, they started with something as simple as a, a small misdemeanor and we didn't do anything to help them. And, and we can see how when we restrict these records that it helps. And, and you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent for even opening up even further, um, just like Brenda was saying earlier, how some states after a certain amount of time, your record is, re is cleared or expunged. I, I think that's something that we really need to look into because the sad part about it, people can get their lives together. And then something as small as a, as a, as a simple possession charge can keep them from moving further. You know, we, we have enough means that we discriminate against people already. Let's remove those barriers and, and continue to help people be the person that they want to be. Thank you so much. So this is my last question. Um, if, a, if another jurisdiction would like to start a program like this, what, what advice would you give them to, to replicate it? I, I think the big thing is, is just to explain to the, all the stakeholders the importance of it. Um, they can pull the stats to see how many people are, are, on, are have been on probation, have, have the opportunity to have their records restricted and, and, and what an impact it would do. Even if they set up an information fair um, to just to get the numbers of people. Um, one of the things that um, my predecessor, Joy at Holmes did, she had a record restriction fair. Um, and it showed the great need that we had in this community uh, for second chance deaths. And, and by doing so, they can see the numbers, they can see the need and just how important it is. Great, that's great. So I'm gonna switch gears now and talk to Alicia Hargrove, Judge, or I just called you Judge. I talked too much to judges. Um, DA Brody, would you just, you can go off camera, but if you just hang around in case anybody has a question at the end, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Definitely. Alicia Hargrove, you're from Henry County, from the yes. DA's office of Henry County, and we are so glad that you have joined us and we really appreciate your time. Can you also, we have your bio in the um, Google doc that's been just dropped. I saw Darcy just dropped it again. Um, but could you tell people a little bit about yourself and how you got to your current position? 
Well, first and foremost, I would like to thank um, everyone for um, their participation on this very important topic. And additionally, the invitation that was extended to me um, because I'm very passionate about this because a little bit about my background is that I started my legal career actually as a, a assistant public defender um, in South Georgia. Um, and during that particular time, I saw um, how a lot of individuals or my former clients were disenfranchised because of the blemishes on their criminal history or their criminal records. And so I knew the importance of having these particular things in place or resources so that people can start their new life um, when they get entangled in the criminal justice system. So fast forward to now, um, I've been with the Henry County District Attorney's Office for a little over two years. And when I arrived in uh, my office um, in Henry County, my DA, um, DA Patillo, actually created um, an idea of having access or around the clock access for people to be able to process or apply for criminal criminal record restriction um, by launching an online portal. So starting last year in 2022, um, Henry County, we have officially launched an online portal where anyone that has had an arrest in Henry County or cases in Henry County can go online to our website, Henry, um, Henry County District Attorney's Office and apply for record restrictions. It's wonderful. So you just told us a little bit about how it gets started. Was there any other background that people should know about how you actually, your, your DA had the idea, but did you have to get an IT, what else did it take to get it started? Did you have to go around, did you have to meet with a bunch of people? Well, what actually took place was um, once DA Patillo created the idea of having an online portal, we connected with an IT specialist that could create the website, a secure website, in the actual process for processing these in a, ve a very safe and efficient manner so that we can do the applications online and the questionnaire that went online. So we there were a lot of meetings um, and also corresponding with other individuals and in other jurisdictions to see how do they process, all, well, applications for record restriction. Um, and at that particular time, once we put all of those resources and in in the information together, we then launched our online portal in 2022. Okay. Okay. So it's really only been a year. So how's it working? Are people uploading? Uh, <laughs> the word is getting out, I must say. Um, I've so far I've processed over a hundred applications um, on the um, online portal. However, I would like to note this as well. I still receive paper applications from our arresting agencies because um, in the statute there's a pre-2013 and a time period where they have to go straight to the arresting agency. And we actually have a partnership with them. So once they initially come to the arresting agency and request a record restriction that file or that application is then sent to me. So not only am I getting online applications, I'm also getting paper applications as well. Okay. Uh, before we go any further, um, you talked about getting the word out. What's a way to get the word out? We have been exploring various methods of doing that. Um, first and foremost, um, creating cards. We actually have a QR code now where people won't have to actually receive any paper or documents. They can just scan on their phone a QR code and they can go straight to the website to apply for record restriction. Also word of mouth, um, partnering up with different agencies when they have clinics or when they have programs within the community, we let them know that this resource is out there. Um, on May 6th, we actually have a career fair where we have invited and they have so graciously accepted the Georgia Justice Project um, to bring a representative to talk about record restriction and give individuals who attend the career fair resources. That's great. That's great. So just like I, we asked everybody else, What's your best story? Uh, I know it's only been a year, so you may not have any, but what's your best story so far? Well, something that's impacted you or you think impacted the community? I have a lot of his, I have a lot of stories um, okay. because my journey regarding record restrictions started um, with Judge Ponder, actually, when I worked in the Doherty County um, Judicial Circuit, when we did a records restriction clinic there, which was a wonderful turnout. Um, and ever since then, I've always had this 
passion to keep it going, to actually look out for people's criminal history, because I know the barriers that come with having those blemishes. So one of my greatest stories, um, basically, is the overall viewpoint of me doing this work is that my process in doing record restriction might be a little bit different than others. And I know some people might say, where does this woman get the time to do this? But I call all of my applicants. Okay. When I go through their criminal history and then I go through all of the statute because the application is very technical. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of exceptions. You have a lot of if, then, or ors. So it's very technical in the way that you apply it. So you have to make sure that you exhaust all of the different possibilities to make sure whether or not they qualify or whether or not they're not um, eligible for record restrictions. So once I go through the packet, I actually call the applicants and talk to them about what exactly um, were you requesting so that I can be clear on the decision that I release. After I obtain that information, and if a person is in fact ineligible, what I do is share with them options. And I always follow up with an email with a detailed step-by-step -step process of what their option options are, if they have any. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> so this is my last question. Um, if there's someone in, in the viewing audience, um, and this is actually going to be recorded on YouTube too, so sometimes people watch it later looking to set something like what you've done up, um, what's your advice to a jurisdiction that might want to replicate your online portal? My advice to replicate this process is first and foremost, you definitely need, you definitely need a dedicated assistant district attorney that can do this work. Um, is that important? Um, because you want to make sure not only are you giving your community adequate resources to have this have this done for them so that they can move on with their life, you also want to make sure it's someone that can apply the law the correct way and make sure that not only I'm giving you the decision on this application, but I'm also going to give you resources. <laughs> so you, you definitely need someone that can take the time out to do this and understand the importance of the work of clearing um, someone's criminal history. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are at the end of our program. We have some time for questions if anybody has any questions. And if not, we'll wrap up now. But before we move on, I actually am interested in, uh, I just started reading about Michigan just passed a law that allows an automatic record restriction after, a, based on people who meet some qualification in a certain a number of years have passed without a, any subsequent um, offense. And I wanted to know if anybody had any idea of the appetite for that in Georgia, if something like that is too far fetched for us. I was surprised that Michigan did that. And with one law, they've affected millions of people. So Brenda may be the one who, I know you talked about it, Brenda, you mentioned, yeah. I just didn't know if it was really something that Georgia could could some, could some do. Would, is, do you hear an appetite for it? So, so there's, there's definitely, definitely an appetite, appetite for it, in, you know, you know, with, with a lot of impacted people, people and agencies and employers. And, employers, um, and, and I think Michigan is, is about the 12th state, state that, that has passed some kind of law and they're all at Pennsylvania was the first. A lot of the others are at various stages of implementation. The, the challenge in Georgia, and we have a whole um, webinar recorded uh, on our website, which folks can go and look at about clean slate reform, is that we do have, we don't have this unified court system. So every jurisdiction would have to do something a little bit different. Um, Eventually, Eventually I, I, I hope, hope that there's, there's an interest in moving Georgia to a, a unified system, system and that will allow us to get to clean slate. So, so we've been, in the absence of that, we've, we've been looking at other ways that could help sort of mass, mass groups, groups of people at once, once you, know, you know, through things like, like every jurisdiction should have a portal like Henry County does, does to deal, particularly to deal with those older non-convictions, you know, that are easy, like books are surprised, surprised that a, a non-conviction that you've even got to do something to get that off of their record. We also, we also think jurisdictions could have you know, standing orders to deal with sealing of non-convictions after it's been restricted. And, and then, of course, you know, expanding service models. And we're trying to work on some 
like, like pro se petitions, petitions that people can download um, if they don't have access to any of these resources. But but, but, but we've, we've got, got some pretty significant, significant challenges because of the way our our court, court record, record systems, systems are organized. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> DA Brett, did you have something to add? I, I just want to say over the last 10 years, we, we have progressed quite a bit. Um, and I think we will continue to do that as we see the benefits of record restrictions um, and, and doing the things that we need to do to make sure we empower our citizens. Um, it's just going to be a matter of times. So I think we'll get there. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to the day when we are much like a Michigan or a Pennsylvania where we, we, where we automatically expunge records after a particular time or we automatically seal stuff with, without having to uh, have someone go pay a lawyer or find a Georgia Justice Project lawyer to take on that project form. Um, it's going to take some time, but we'll get there. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad. I'm going to end on that very hopeful note, unless anybody else has anything to say. And one of the things that was interesting about Michigan is the framing of that issue, at least in this one article I read, it was about a workforce issue, basically, that, that you know, we need to bring these, it's, it was affecting several million people, and we need these people in the workforce. And so I thought that was an interesting way to frame it. And I think that's palatable, too. All right, well, we've come to the end of our um, seminar on record restrictions. We really appreciate our audience joining us. And this will be available on the GSU Law School's um, YouTube channel. And we'll be sending out that link um, after this is up. And I appreciate everybody being here. I thank the panelists for all of the time and the um, attention that you've given this issue and this work that you do every day. And have a fabulous rest of your Monday. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>